seemed to me that General Sherman concentrated all his artillery and turned loose on my little squad. We were at the foot of a slope and they couldn't get quite low enough, but finally a cannonball struck the little bank of dirt in our front, tearing it to smithereens and the little log on top of the dirt for our head protection struck my head. Oh my. At 10 o'clock, we are ordered ashore with all our equipment, including 40 rounds of ammunition. With our knapsacks, haversacks, canteen, and almost everyone had an extra suit of clothes and our overcoats, haversacks filled the top with hardtack. We formed in line on the bluff overlooking the river. We were in great confusion as Colonel Reed and Dewey galloped back and forth without seeming to know exactly what they were doing. Colonel Dewey did a considerable amount of hard swearing and I had time to notice him wheel his horse around and take some consolation through the neck of a pint bottle. This seemed to give him a stronger flow of swear language than before. One day while sitting and lying out behind our work, some of the boys got into a controversy concerning a battery which was occasionally firing a shot. It was off considerable distance to our left, but we were not sure whether it was ours or the enemy's battery. When Andy Youngblood raised his index finger, pointing and said, I bet you five dollars that is a Yankee battery. Gray ball from a Yankee picket clipped off his finger. The wounded men were by this time coming in freely and were being carried right through our ranks. And we could see hundreds of soldiers running through the woods. We started on the double quick in the direction of the heavy firing. The woods were full of infantry, cavalry, artillery, and all arms of the service were flying toward the river in countless numbers. Men yelled as they passed us, don't go out there, you'll catch hell. We're all cut to pieces, we are ripped. The enemy opened up on us with artillery at close range using great hamster shell and all manner of deadly missiles. At last we could see them, and they were advancing around our left flank and the woods seemed alive with gray coats and their victorious cheer and unearthly yells and the concentrated fire which they had leveled upon us caused somebody to give the order to retreat. As we started down the ravine, a wounded rebel caught me by the leg as I was passing and looking up at me said, my friend, for God's sake, give me a drink of water. He had been shot about the head and was covered in blood to his feet. I at once thought of that command if thine enemy thirst give him drink and I halted and tried to get my canteen from under my accoutrements, but I could not and pulled away from him and said, I have not time to help you. Ambulances and men are hurrying over the field and gathering up the wounded. The surgeons are cutting off the arms and legs. Burying parties and details are out, burying the dead this evening. The terrible rain of last night has filled the ground with water. The trees are just bursting into leaf and little flowers are covering the ground. But their fragrance is lost in the pall of death which has settled down on this bloody field. This is the valley in the shadow of death. I've left untouched very many interesting events. For instance, uh, my dear friend and schoolmate, Napoleon Bonaparte Hamrick was killed there. His father and family lived out two miles from here in a place now called the Hill Place on the road to Ferris Griffiths. N.B. had three brothers in the war and all come through alive. I yet remember the names of the whole family. Uncle Billy, Aunt Polly, Jerome, Napoleon Bonaparte, Jeroboam, Zora Babel, Doc Cortez, and Don Pedro were the boys. All were my schoolmates. From the words of Carol Clark and Cyrus Boyd.